Hello everyone. Um, today I want to talk about most Carson and I try to use it as an example um, to show you how how you can read papers of deep learning. So how you can learn deep learning in a meaningful way. So um, uh, let's get started. Um, there are actually four parts. Uh, the first part is how the data input pipeline. So how do you read your data from a source format? And then how to do pre-processing, augmentations, and kind of stuff. And this part is sort of a trivia, and I'll ignore this part. And then we talk about the network architecture. Uh, this is really very important, and then we'll try to figure out the details of convolutional networks and how to design networks. The third part is about training and evaluation. And um, this is more like an experiment, um, uh, and you reproduce the, res the, perform the results in the paper. But uh, you need a good computer to do this, and I would just uh, also skip this part. And finally, we will come to a discussion. Uh, we'll focus on discussion of um, how people design networks and what you can learn from reading papers. Uh, you will gain some research uh, experience and learn some techniques uh, through the discussion. Um, and before I get started, I want to give you some tips. First thing is thinking data structure. Uh, this is really important. When you read a paper, you are looking at some descriptions, intuitive stuff. But you have to think of them in terms of program, uh, in terms of data structure, uh, in order to fully understand the details, uh, you must think in that way to understand the details. So, for example, when talk about an image, um, what it comes to your mind is should not just be an image; it should be a four-dimensional tensor in PyTorch. Um, so, the first one is a batch, and the second one is channel, and height and width, or width or height. I'm not sure. Uh, this one's I think is height and width and well, it's really not that important. Um, but we have to understand uh, the second one is a channel. So what pops up into your mind is a tensor like this. Also, we talk about bounding boxes. What comes to your mind is not just a bounding box, OK? What comes to your mind is a tensor of three dimension. First is batch. Second one is number of boxes. Third is of length four. It's the coordinates of a bounding box. Uh, and this is how it's represented in PyTorch. Also, uh, when talk about classification, what comes to your mind, you should not think of them as just cat or dog or airplane, that kind of stuff. What comes to your mind is a batch of tables. So uh, the first dimension is batch, then the second dimension is m, that is the number of images you have in that batch. And each image will have n outputs. These n outputs are the probabilities of each class. So if you have 10 um, class labels, it probably a equals 10, right? And then the entries are just uh, between 0 and 1. They're just probabilities. And you pick the biggest probability to be your class label, to be your prediction. So when you talk about classification, you should think of it as this, uh, this way. And obviously, what you want to do is also think in terms of operation. So, for example, when we talk about convolution, what what pops into your mind should be this stuff. This is how we do convolution. So this is input depth, output depth, color size, stride, and padding. And input depth and output depth are the most important part. And also you have to, what comes to your mind is that convolution is not just convolution. They are combined with batch normalization and some activation like RELU or Leaky, RELU, or that kind of stuff. So basically, these three operations are most of, mostly used together. So when we talk about convolution, you should, these things should pop up in your mind. And the third thing is the example questions that you can ask whenever you read a paper. Uh, first question you can ask is, what is the main contribution of this paper? So for, for example, in math Gerson, why do you want to do classification, detection, and segmentation, three things together. Why do we want that? And can they help each other? Or what's the difference? So um, 
after you have this mean contribution, then you have to ask, how did it do that, right? What's the key idea? Um, and also, uh, we would like to see um, where is the idea come from, and this part is very important. Uh, so, uh, and th what this means is like uh, a lot of the papers they are not just uh, built from uh, out of nowhere. Their ideas they might, they always refer to ideas from someone else. So, um, for example, well, the first time I read SSD, I think the SSD detector is really a, a very good thing. Everything says in the paper it makes sense and it's perfect. So we cannot make improvements over there. Uh, but then the in another paper called Feature Pyramid Network, it says that SSD is good, but the way it creates its features is not good enough. And then we propose a different way uh, to create uh, a feature pyramid. Uh, that's what we call Feature Pyramid Network. And then th this feature will be better at predicting small objects. So, and this idea is used in Mascara CNN. So you see when we uh, when th they always say like uh, from paper uh, what what paper their idea is good but it's not good enough so we make an improvement and it's really important that you focus on how when the in the place where the paper says that they are making improvement so and you have this is always you can learn how to make improvements and these are the things you can apply in your future research so. Uh, if you focus on this part, you will learn some design experience uh, from uh, reading the paper, and that's what, what you can take away. So um, these are the questions we are going to discuss. Next, uh, let me quickly go over the architecture. The reason I'm choosing Mascar CNN is like it, it borrows ideas from various places, uh, various good uh, papers and combine them together. So it's really good like if you combine other people's together, ideas together, you get a very good result. So the basic feature extractor is uh, ResNet and it's a very good network. And if you haven't read about it, it's fine. I'll just I'll, I'll talk about it uh, in my presentation. So don't worry. It's not that difficult. Um, and then this is new paper called Feature Pyramid Network. And basically, you can just uh, combine this guy to any kind of feature extractor. So the ResNet combined with Feature Pyramid Network, they, they together form the feature extractor of Muscar and uh, this, is, this, is, this is also a very good paper. And then the third thing to talk about is Region Proposal Network. It's, um, and it's important that uh, you understand why do we want region proposal um, so why it makes things really fast so this actually proposes from faster and um, um, yeah um, yes and also um, uh, this point pretty interesting and I will talk about it in detail so uh, third, the other thing is what we call ROI09. So this guy is um, oops. So this ROI09, um, this is a very important part in, in Mascarsian. So many people they have read the paper faster than and they all they all come up with the idea like why can't we do segmentation right when we have the batch we when we have the regions and their class labels why don't we do a segmentation um, I I believe that some other people maybe try this idea or they they can pop up with this idea it's very natural when you have um, classification detection you also can do segmentation. But this idea is quite intuitive, and but it's not that really uh, easy to implement. So the key key idea, the key thing that makes sense, uh, that boosts the performance is this ROI alignment operation, and you have to understand why, uh, why what what this 
operation is and why we need that. So, um, and the head, what I mean the head is usually the layer that's when you have the feature you put in the head, then it produce output. So that's what I mean by head. And the uh, nose function, this is a very important part. Uh, in my opinion, that the loss function, you know, uh, it will really affect the final performance of your design. So if you have a bad design loss function, then probably it won't succeed. Uh, and there are different ways to design to design loss functions, especially you do some regularization or you do some trade-offs in detection. So in capsule network, uh, there is a very novel way of doing or doing recognition using reconstruction error. And that's really very interesting. But here uh, we are doing a multitask analysis. Uh, that's, we have two banners, classification, detection, and segmentation. And also in ULO, we also have a trade-off between designing these NOS. Here we also, so uh, over here, we, our focus is how we design NOS functions. And um, the second thing is, when you have the theory, you have the experience of designing those functions. How do you implement them in Python? And this is a very important thing. So many people, when we, when they talk about those functions, they know that, but they don't know how to do that in Python. How do you calculate the area of a bounding box? How do you calculate the IO intersection of a union, or that kind of stuff? It's really very simple. Uh, Oh, I mean, there are these operations that are really reproducible. You can just see how people actually calculate this, doing these calculations in Python, and uh, just understand that, uh, use it, put it into your library to use. So in the future, when you see a loss function, you're not just, it's not just a loss function. It's a, it's a piece of code you can really see. So this is also very important. And about training, so training is about some parameters or something, but uh, it's probably not very important uh, in this lecture. Um, what's special about Mascarcian is it's actually the same like FastRCN. It's got a region proposal network, and you have to do some alternate training or something. So what you need to understand is how to fix some parts of a network while training another part. Uh, I would just, that, that, that's the only thing I want to talk about in training. So uh, let's talk about the data flow. Uh, first, we read in the image as a batch, then we extract features using feature pyramid. Um, so this image is actually from taken from faster and paper. So uh, this feature is just uh, like this, just think of it like this. But in fact, now we are having our feature pyramid. Then it goes to the region proposal network. It generates some region proposals. It combines features over here. And then you go here is uh, ROI pooling. But uh, this is from Mascar Senior, so it's not just pooling, you are also alignment. Um, what this means is you have this feature in different shapes, different aspect ratios, different scales. Uh, but we have to pull these features and group them together like the same shape and so that we can do some convolution operations. Uh, for classification, or just, or you can generate masks, and then compute uh, NOS functions. Uh, that's basically the overflow, overall flow. And uh, here I'd like to start from the second one, go through the region proposal and general proposals. So this actually is the same as first hours, and uh, and I want to start from here to make things simple. Then I will go down here and go up over here. Uh, but today, let's go focus on the region proposal. Uh, so region proposal network. Um, a region proposal network takes an image of any size as input and output a set of rectangular object proposals, each with an object in score. So this is an intuitive illustration, and this is what people say in the paper. But uh, when you really think of things in detail, you will find that uh, things are not not that easy. It's not actually what you, you expect it to be. So our input, in terms of data structure, is a batch of features. 
shadow, height and width. And then we have the intermediate output. We don't have direct output, we have an intermediate output. So the region proposal class logics is the object that is called. We have foreground and background, and the class uh, is just the between speaker, so the class and the bounding box. Uh, the bounding box is not coordinates, they are data, data of coordinates. And I'll explain soon what this data mean. So it's really not just bounding box coordinates. Then we will do some operations. We will get our final bounding boxes. It, it's batch and number of bounding boxes. This for means it's coordinates. Um, and the coordinates are normalized. So they are between zero and one, and it's still different from what you expect, right? It's not just like these coordinates. So this is in terms of data structure. This is the intuition. You see it's quite different. And we have to go in further detail and see how we can implement this uh, region proposal network. And so this um, slide I'm going to talk about anchor boxes. Uh, anchor box is really one of the best, uh, greatest inventions like foot detection, it really boosts things. It's used in SSD and Yulu and faster CNN. And in order to understand what it is, um, first uh, let's uh, understand the, the old way people do is that we want to, when we have an image, we resize it in different scales, and then we extract features from different from these images. And then we, we try to use this to deal with scale invariance. So if you have a big dog and you have a small dog, it doesn't it doesn't matter. If you extract features like this, you will probably get a small object. And this this way is that we only use one image, but we use different uh, size of filters to uh, do this. Um, but uh, these two ways are, all, are both computationally expensive. So uh, the idea of anchor boxes is that we only use one filter and one image, one scale image, but we propose different reference boxes as as our initial proposals. So our initial proposals are just these reference boxes. These are called anchor boxes. That's the idea. So as it that means these ideas are just free, right? They're just free. They come out of no. They're just fixed, and they don't need to do anything. And uh, we will see in detail like how how they are represented and what they, what actually does these anchor boxes mean. But here, just get an intuition like these anchor boxes are free. Just uh, each position you have some reference box. That's it. And then we have to understand the problem of bounding box regression. Uh, so what is bounding box regression? We input is a uh, so training pairs. So this is your input. You have some coordinates, and uh, this is x y means the center of the bounding box. W h means width and height. And then we have the g means the ground truth box. This is the ground truth box, and this is our input box. And our task is trying to do regression. That is, we try to estimate a mapping from our proposal to the ground truth. So this is, this mapping is expressed uh, using this formula here. And they do this for some numerical reasons or something like sometimes it takes exponential, sometimes it takes a square, a square root. Uh, well, just the, this is just a mathematic formulation. But the main idea is we have the mapping, we have the proposed box, we estimate the mapping, then we have the predicted boxes. We want the predicted boxes to be as close as to the grand truth box. This is a problem of bounding box regression. And also, one thing we have to notice is that we want these uh, proposal boxes to have large overlap with our grand truth box. So if it's really far away, then it doesn't make sense to do a regression. So uh, we want to have a large overlap. Overlap. That's the key idea. So now uh, let's see the anchor boxes. Uh, they, what, how are the anchor, bo anchor boxes used? Um, they just use this as reference box uh, as an initial proposal, and we try to estimate a regression uh, to 
uh, estimate mapping. So when we apply this mapping to these anchor boxes, they get mapped to the ground truth box. That's it. That's uh, what we want to estimate. Um, and here are the things uh, I want to talk about. So first you have to, uh, it's natural, right? We have so many anchor boxes, but not all of them are good because we want, want the, we only want the anchor boxes that are, have a large overlap with the ground truth box. And we apply the uh, estimation to only those boxes. And so obviously we want, we have a filtering step somewhere that the filter these anchor boxes. And the second question is when we have to understand what is here and what is not here. So what I mean is that, um, so on each position, we have a, for example, here we have a filter size like this. And we, for example, if we have K anchor boxes, uh, they are of different scales, different shape, aspect ratio. And so, for example, if we want to have K anchor boxes, each position, then we must have K different filters. Each filter will only be responsible for one anchor box. So this, um, this one will be responsible for this aspect ratio. And we have a different filter for this aspect ratio. So between different anchor aspect ratio or scales, uh, they are not shared. Filters are not shared. And also, each filter, you know, the output of each filter is uh, only one number. But uh, for classification, we need one for foreground score. We need one for background score. That means we need two K filters for classification. And uh, for regression, we have like each box, we have four coordinates. So we need four filters for each aspect ratio for each box. That means we have 4K filters for all the anchor boxes. Um, this is only for one position, but uh, convolution is shared across different positions. So uh, these filters are shared across the position, but within each position uh, between different anchor boxes, they're not shared. So they do their own job. Each filter do a specific task across the space and that's that that's how you design the filters um so now let's get into the actual implementation uh in pytorch we in, we can basically implement everything in a class so implement a layering class uh, this is what we call rpn layer uh, first we do an initialization um, we have to specify how many, this is uh, how many anchor boxes per location. This is a K, right? How, how many proposals we want. And the anchor stride is how much, how far we uh, slide the anchor boxes. Um, this is a uh, lot very important. And the depth, depth is that the input um, channel, input depth, the features, when you input the features, you the input depth, you, this is uh, what you care about. You only need to know this. And then we, uh, during initialization, we also define some um, operations. And uh, this is uh, really important, and like uh, I'll explain soon. So padding, well, this is a self-implemented padding function. You can just ignore that. Uh, well, I think this is from TensorFlow they port the function from TensorFlow in PyTorch. Uh, uh, I'm not sure like in, in detail what's the padding function, what's different in the padding functions, but well, just have this padding function, but don't, doesn't matter. So what matters here are the convolutions. This is uh, input convolution, input depth, output is 512, 512. Um, the RELU, the, Convolution classification of the max binding box. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about here is a good practice you can learn is de define name for your operation. Uh, as you can see that these these are three convolutions, right? But they serve as a different purpose. This convolution is used to uh, take the input feature and cal calculate it, 
a future, a, a different set of future features. And these features, we call them shared features, because based on these features, we will produce output for classification and also for bounding box regression. So this convolution is used to output classification and its input is five, 512 and its output is two by K, right? As I mentioned previously, one, two K for classification. And uh, this is software max, the number of dimension is two, right? We have two class. And this is this is convolution for bounding box regression. And we have four by K. And so the takeaway is that, uh, imagine that someone ask you, how do you use convolution to generate output for, for classification or detection, right? How do you do that? Uh, well, as you can see, this is a really common question, like in SSD or somewhere else, people always use convolution to do uh, classification, to do segmentation, to do uh, detection. Already. So you really have to understand how to design these layers. And in fact, it's pretty simple. We always use layer, or we use kernel size one by one. Uh, we use thread one, and the output is just um, how many things you want, right? Here we want 2K, here we want 4K. Um, this is basically what, how you design that, how you design, how you use convolution to output. Um, but um, if you are careful enough, you will think uh, that this, this is actually not what we want. So there are some details. So let me explain what I mean. Uh, generally speaking, PyTorch, when you have the initialization function, you have to also uh, define the forward path, the forward function. To, this is a main data flow. So first operation is x, and we pad x, we get the convolution, we compute REOU. So uh, this, is conf this is to uh, compute the features. Uh, we call this shared features between classification and detection. Then we use this, first we use these features uh, to compute the uh, convolution class. We call this RPN class logics. So uh, this com cla class is just, in the previous slides, we see it's just a convolution. But uh, as you imagine that we we want our output to be of a different shape. As I said uh, in the very beginning, for classification, our um, our data should be of this shape. So it's batch, it's m by two. So it's a table, it's m by two. We have two classes over here, and we have uh, m port, m inputs. So um, how we do that in uh, PyTorch is that First we do, uh, so here you see uh, the output is batch, uh, it's two by K, um, two by K outputs in, in depth and height and width. So uh, what we do is first we do a permutation. We permute the second dimension to the fourth dimension. And this is what this, do, this does. And then we always want a contiguous operation before we do the view function. So this is, um, just remember this this process. Then in the view function, we keep the first dimension and the next dimension is two. And minus one means we calculate whatever was left. Uh, and that's what we have for the classification. That's how we receive this classification. And then we do a softmax to compute the probabilities. So this is the uh, detailed flow um, of classification. So if you think of this in operation, you should really understand how do we use convolution for to generate output for classification. That is first we design convolution layer uh, like this, we do a convolution. Then we reshape the output in proper format. Then we do a soft max to get the output. This is how, uh, how you, th you should think of classification in terms of operation. And what about uh, regression? It's the same same flow, right? We calculate the convolution. This is convolution for bounding box. We permute it. And what's different is that we have four over here, right? But uh, we don't have a softmax. So um, 
This is what we call the intermediate output. We have the logics, we have probabilities, and we have the deltas. So these are deltas. Uh, that means we are not doing the coordinates, and you will see soon what this means. Um, but uh, let's ask some questions. This is region proposal network, but we are the what we are the anchor boxes. Uh, we don't see any anchor boxes, right? And then we need to do some filtering to these anchor boxes, and we also want the coordinates of the anchor boxes, not just some deltas. These these are deltas. So um, this let's um, this is basically what I asked in the slide. So um, we need to transform the output into box coordinates, and we need to do filtering to the anchor boxes. And this part, we don't use a network to do that because there's no parameter to train. We just do it in a function called proposal function. Input of this function is the anchor boxes and the uh, deltas. This delta is the output from, this delta is just RPM bounding box from previous night. And these scores, these scores are just the class uh, scores uh, from previous night, the output from classification and some filter parameters. Um, this is not very important. Uh, so anyway, we are the anchor boxes. So the anchor boxes, as you can imagine, they are just free, right? They just they're like this. They're free. They come out of no. Uh, they're just you can define them in, when you initialize the network. So they are actually generated using a utility function, and this function is really reusable. So um, you can see here, this is just a re reusable function doing this. And you have to specify the scale, the ratio, the stride, um, different kinds of hyperparameters. But anyway, you can have your anchor box, number of boxes, and the uh, four coordinates. But uh, they're not in batches, so there's no batch. Um, uh, why, why, why are they not in batches? Because the operations we do are not in batch. We just do them one by one. By one. So, but that's not. Uh, there's another important thing. I want to talk about is that, as you can imagine, many of these uh, anchor boxes are, are background. So most of them are background. They have a very high background score, and only a few of them will be the the foreground, the object, the thing we want. So if we want to do filtering. Hmm, do we use foreground score or background score? Of course, we want to do the uh, foreground score because if you use a background score, and uh, most of the things, uh, most of the most of the boxes are background scores. So um, we we'll sort them. You will have um, uh, so okay. When you when you sort them, you will not have a very um, when you sort, uh, most of them are in the end, in the very last part, and these, these are not good. So, uh, but you can do a reverse sort. That's it. Um, but here we're using the foreground. Um, uh, when you do the arg max, you do the foreground, foreground score. Um, because here uh, it's just a matter of choice, right? Here we just choose the foreground score. Now the input is uh, probabilities and the bounding box, and so you can see batch anchors, and these these are not just these are not x x one one these are deltas, so these are just the small displacement that we are going to apply to the um, anchor box. So re remember, like I said, uh, the problem of bounding box regression is that we're trying to estimate the mapping from uh, the anchor boxes, the uh, initial proposals to our ground truth box. So um, this mapping is represented by these four numbers. So once we apply these things to our um, reference boxes, anchor boxes, then there will be the ground truth box, the, our prediction of object. And these things are computed by adjusting the parameters in the region proposal network. So that's why we want to train them. 
And uh, obvious first, we want to squeeze the input. We only support batch of number size one uh, because our anchor uh, because of our anchor boxes don't have a batch dimension. And we use squeeze and unsqueeze to expand dimensions. And then we use foreground score. So uh, the inputs, the first inputs, uh, we choose the uh, for, this is background score, foreground score, and we choose the foreground score because this is squeezed. So this one is not here, and we just choose the second dimension and use uh, one, the foreground score. Then we do a sort, and uh, um, sort is a really a very uh, important uh, operation when you do operations to binding boxes. Uh, so uh, first here is that we do a limit. We want only these six thousand uh, boxes, or if it's not uh, bigger than six thousand, then it's just whatever you have. And then we do a sort, use a descending order. We have the score in order. So this is descending because we have some foreground, we want the large foreground scores. So if you're using the background scores, you probably want the ascending sorting. And uh, I'm not sure like why, whether what, whether this is faster or not. But yeah, this is um, what they did. And then they have this order information in this one. Uh, they have these scores over here. Um, obviously, this may this this will be a non vector, and we only want the whatever number um, boxes we want. So we take the first. Uh, let's say six thousand. Okay, we take the first six thousand order first six thousand scores, and of course we choose the anchors of all these six. So this is basically a filtering. Uh, in Python, right? When you do a selection using index anchors, so you have these uh, anchor boxes going out here. Um, but for the bounding boxes, uh, we will first do a standardization uh, before we do the selection. So if you select and standardize, well, I, I don't know if there's a big difference or not, but uh, here we just uh, standardize it first. Um, so this is a standard deviation, and we the delta is as the inputs. Um, so this bounding box over here, and we just input them, uh, and we just multiply them. I, I, to be frank, to be frank, I don't know why they want to do the standardization, but they just did it. So, uh, but that's not really important. Then we do the filter using order data to filter the data. So now we have the, uh, for example, so in our example, we have like 6,000 um, bounding boxes uh, of reference box, anchor boxes selected. And then we want to apply this, uh, our transformation. We want to apply the our displacement to these reference boxes to get our predictive box. And we also want a clip operation. What this means is some of the boxes may come out of the image. So we have a clip operation. The idea, so first we apply box data. Uh, the input is anchors and the filtered anchors and the filtered data. Then we got our boxes. Then we have our image shape, get our height and width uh, image shape. And then we do a clip this clip basically is this operation. So you need the window information. So exactly how, how long is your window and then you clip those boxes. So this window is a four dimension. This is just construct the window as a four dimension. And this is come from our image shape. Uh, this this is config. This is basically a hyperparameter you specify for the network. And how do you actually do these two operations? Um, apply box data, so um, that is from this. This is the reference coordinates. Then we want to do it in this in different formats. So um, basically, um, you know the anchor boxes are in x one y one x two y two, but uh, in you know this in this formula, the x y are center of your 
uh, finding box in WH are the hidden width. So you first uh, convert x convert things into height width center coordinates. Then you apply the deltas using exactly this formula. So it's not difficult to see how do you do that. And then you transform uh, them from back to the coordinates format. So from center height width to x1, y1, x2, y2. Then you stack this as a result. This is how you apply these deltas to your reference anchor boxes. And then now you get the predicted box uh, you have you want. And then uh, you do a clip. Uh, this, the the clip is use is actually just using the function of clap. So clap plays a function uh, which is um, probably like um, just a clap. I, I don't know how to explain. It. It's like if it's bigger than it's it's clamped. It's it's higher than it's clamped. Uh, that's basically it. Uh, I think you can understand what I mean. Uh, also, this is how you implement the activation. So R E L U when you activate it, when it's smaller than zero, it's zero. So so far we have all the boxes ready, right? We have the anchor boxes. We applied the deltas as outputs from our uh, region proposal network. Uh, apply these delta or filter the uh, anchor boxes, and then we apply these deltas um, to these boxes, and then we do some clipping uh, to these boxes. And that's perfect, right? But it's not finished yet. There's something we call no maximal suppression. We have to do this. And that's why we still need class scores, right? Why do you need class scores? We haven't used the class scores. And what is no maximal suppression? I don't want to go too much in detail, but I want to say that you don't need to care too much. So actually, there's a very good uh, implementation and uh, on GPU is so even CUDA. And if you are interested in details, you can read you can read in the source code and see how it does. But uh, the takeaway is that we already have a reusable, fast implementation of this algorithm. And the um, purpose of this algorithm is that you is that to make you only detect an object only once. Uh, so this is an illustration. Uh, when you have a car over here, you may have like three boxes detecting this car, but we want to only take the highest probability. So in this case, we only take this box. In this case, we only take this one. So this is uh, another filter step you need. And now we're not ready there. <laughs> we still need to normalize, okay? We still need to normalize and uh, unsqueeze into a, uh, into a sort of, a, into a, to add the batch, batch dimension, and then we, then we're done. So um, this is a whole pipeline of uh, region proposal network. And in fact, you see there are more details than you, you think, right? Uh, previously, intuition is very intuitive, but you have to understand these details. So the takeaway is that what is the flow of region proposal network? So first, you do a convolution to generate the shear convolution. Then this convolution are used. These features are used to generate class classification scores and coordinates delta recording deltas. And these parts are trainable, so that's why we train for these parts. Then we mm, have the anchor boxes. We standardize them. We filter them by zero score, and we um, apply uh, the delta the coordinates uh, to the reference boxes. Uh, we do the non-maximal suppression. We normalize these coordinates. And then this is a whole pipeline of the uh, region proposal network. And uh, well, this is a very uh, classical operation, I, I, I should say. And so, I mean, um, generally speaking, when do the region proposal in classical methods, this is a, a manufactured way uh, uh, I call that, they, they have a different algorithm to do the region proposal. I cannot remember the name, it's some of them called grid search or something, but so this part is previously done by a very expensive way and all the other things are the same. So this is a very classical standard. What this paper changes is only this part. So they, they're using a network to do this. 
uh, they are using the anchor reference boxes and uh, use a convolutional network to compute the class scores and, re and regression and to make this part trainable. And that's what makes the difference. And that's how you, I mean, how, how you transform a classical algorithm into a deep learning uh, to use network to solve problems. And uh, the second thing I wanted to point out is that uh, the uh, state of our object detection comes in two groups. One is with region proposal, one is purely regression based. And I, I'd like to compare uh, these, these two groups. So the regression based is Euro and SSD. And, but they also use ink boxes. So it's a good thing that, that in our discussion session, we compare these two paradigms and see which one is better or how to improve or something. And third thing is like, takeaway is that region based is sort of a, a, a meta algorithm that is region based class. Basically, you can do region plus anything, region based classification. Region based detection, region based segmentation, region based post estimation. So basically, everything you can be region based. So uh, that means uh, you can always attach a re region proposal network to do something. So that's really a very, this is really like an intention mechanism. And uh, I'm not sure like whether it works for most parts, but region based plus this uh, idea that maybe you can. Uh, sort of take this whole pipeline and use it somewhere. Maybe someday you want to use it somewhere to solve your problem. So, um, okay, that's basically for this part. Next part of feature extraction, but I will do it in, in a different video.